I'm Viv Grosskop, stand-up comedian, agony aunt, and very proud author of a brand spanking new book, which I feared might never see the light of day, so yay! And this is We Are Women. We Are Women is brought to you by Mint Velvet. It's the place to talk about being a woman, the glamour, the glory, and of course, the glitches. Each episode has a theme. This time we're going to talk about the journey, what we gather as we travel through the world and as we travel through life, and whether thinking about experience as a journey is actually all that useful. Coming up very shortly, we'll be hearing from the broadcaster, Gabby Logan. When I was younger, I really I honestly thought I would have a nose job by the time I was about 22. You know, I, I fixated on my nose. From the international campaigner, Britta Fernandez-Schmidt. You're not just giving the money, you are telling that woman that you are her sister and that you care for her. And from the presenter and activist, Liana Bird. We should all be maybe a little bit more adventurous and not be afraid of people staring and just to have a bit more fun. Otherwise, what's going to happen in 20 years? Everyone's just going to be in kind of brown boiler suits or something. But first, let me introduce our very special guest. I'm so excited that she's here. She's an award-winning journalist who's writing on love, sex, feminism, books, travel, you name it, appears absolutely everywhere. She also writes and directs for television and has been involved with smash hits such as Fresh Meat, Peep Show and Made in Chelsea. She also co-hosts the superlative weekly pop culture and news podcast, The High Low. And if that were not enough, she's written her first book now, Everything I Know about love. Welcome Dolly Alderton. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And also congratulations on finishing that book because God knows that's difficult. (laughs) I know it's good to get things done that you said you would do especially when somebody's already paid you for it. Now you (laughs) tweeted a couple of days ago that not only the proofs of your new book had arrived but branded tote bags. Yeah. Our episode today is all about the journey Mm. and that's an amazing triumphant end to a journey. How do you feel when you've reached that destination? It was amazing actually because I had I did a kind of showcase Penguin my publisher did a showcase of their spring writers and I went and I hadn't held a proof before I remember Lena Dunham saying the most amazing thing about writing a book is holding it in your hands and nothing can quite I know it sounds pretentious and kind of maybe too elevated but nothing can quite prepare you for that moment where you kind of flip open a page and you're like oh my god that is a word that I came up with and then I went home and I was like I'm so happy and I want to mark this moment because it did feel like the moment of a journey in life and a, and a professional journey so I went to my pub at the end of my road <laughs> I went in on the way home and I said a glass of your finest champagne please and they said we don't have that but we have carver so I said that's fine so I sat and drank some flat carver to mark that moment in the journey <laughs> Do you think it's important when you achieve something that you do mark it in some way? And what yeah. other ways have you marked your achievements with as you've done things? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, the passage of time is something that I'm quite gripped by. And my mum is the first as well to always say my mum's kind of boundlessly happy Canadian little bunny of a woman. And she said, you know, as you journey through life, things get really tough and and you know, tragedy does strike. And as all that stuff happens and life gets more difficult, it's even more important that when there's a moment of joy to raise a glass of flat carver and just take stock. Mm, I love the sound of your Canadian bunny mother. I want, <laughs> I want a Canadian bunny as my mother. I was Do you know just... what? She's got so much love to give, Viv. She'd love to hold you to close to her bosom. <laughs> it's not too late for me to be adopted. That would be great. Do you think that you have a lot of positivity and drive, but do you think that comes from the strength that you got from your mum? Does it come from your upbringing? Where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I've realised with age, like... I'm just very privileged. I, I haven't had to battle with a huge amount of adversity or, or tragedy throughout my life, my very comfortable, lovely middle class life. So I think that probably engenders positivity. <laughs> um, so I'd love to say it's like a beautiful Buddhist thing that I've cultivated. I think a lot of it will be accidental that I've had quite a nice life so far. I love the idea that the shortcut to Buddhism is having a nice middle class life. It's <laughs> basically the same thing. Yeah, either you go and chant every day 
or you grow up in a household where there's never a shortage of hummus. Same level of enlightenment and fulfillment. <laughs> you have reached another milestone recently as well. You've just had a birthday. Is that- yes. And you shared a to-do list of things that you wanted to achieve before your birthday. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is again the marking thing that I do. I mean, I'm such a teenager, um, but every year I do try and write down things that I would like. To, to achieve that year um, and as I've got older that I've become kinder to myself because it was you know fall in love or um, be a size eight or whatever these stuff always a good goal <laughs> just, <laughs> not we're joking just wildly like unattainable and just stuff that doesn't matter so now I try and do stuff that I'm like what will affect me every day and be really great so Getting better at guitar was one of them. Uh, ringing my mum more was another. I'm going to ring your mum more too now <laughs> as well. Um, she'd love to hear from you, Viv. And uh, I did, uh, some of them didn't get out the door. One of them was explore spirituality and religion in a non half assed bet hedgy way. <laughs> But you don't need to, though, because you're already middle class and hummus eating. Yeah, exactly. The spirituality <laughs> comes to you naturally. I want to uh, challenge you to think of something uh, by the end of this show. Mm. Uh, for next birthday, what okay. would you like to have achieved? And I'm going to think about it too. We do this in every podcast. We try and give somebody something to think about okay, okay. as a bit of a challenge. Um, in honour of Dolly and her achievements, please come and share your goals to be achieved before your next birthday, come to the Mint Velvet Facebook page or please tweet us at Mint Velvet. And in the meantime, we have a few more gems from the accumulating treasure trove of advice to share with other women. On our Facebook page, Felicity very wisely reminds us how important it is to learn to say no. And Lisa says, be kind to yourself always. I'm Edith Bowman. I'm a mum, I'm a broadcaster, I'm Scottish. Um, And the advice that I would give to another woman is don't take no for an answer. I think if you believe in yourself and you have conviction and your beliefs in what it is that you want to do and you work towards it and you don't take no for an answer, then you will achieve it. My name is Jo Cook. I work for Cancer Research UK and the advice I would give my younger self is to stress slightly less, significantly less probably, about when I was going to meet the love of my life. Either it's going to happen, in which case great, or it's not going to happen, in which case there are lots of other very exciting, great options and the waste of time is worrying about it. My name is Lucy. I work for a creative agency in London. Um, My advice for another woman is to go for a run down a beach. You'll feel great afterwards. It's life affirming. Thank you, Edith, Joe, and Lucy. And before that, Felicity and Lisa. We'll hear our interview with Gabby Logan very soon. But just before we do... Liana Bird is a presenter who has her own show on Radio X and has just launched a brand new podcast called Get It Off Your Breasts with Emma Gannon. She's the co-founder of the charity Help Refugees and this year started the Kindly Collective, which champions projects supporting women, children and creatures across the globe. And she is an extremely sassy dresser, which is why we wanted to talk to her for our feature about how our clothes reveal ourselves. My life in clothes. I think the best way to look at clothes, in my opinion anyway, is that they are a lot of fun. I know that when I was really young, my mum used to say that I always like um, used to wear really weird stuff. So when she'd try and take me to the beach, I'd always want to wear like a kind of slightly ball gowny type dress and I'd insist on it. Or when we were going to like something smart, I'd want to wear like a fancy dress outfit. But she let me. And I think that's nice because I think there shouldn't be any rules with fashion and what you're wearing. And really, it should just be about what you feel like at that particular moment. Uh, Okay, so the first thing I wanted to show you today was a polka dot shirt. This is actually a hand-me-down that I got from my granny. Um, It's quite nice, this idea of people handing down clothes generation to generation. And so when my granny died, she was 103. And she was a super cool granny. You know, she she used to race motorbikes. She escaped from Russia as a refugee when she was 11 and just 
turned her life around, ended up starting all kinds of charities to help other children um, and young musicians coming from Russia who had talent. She just was a really, really inspirational woman. She was still hosting feminist meetings in her house when she was like in her hundreds and still doing workouts every day. And so this is a really special piece to me. And I, I, I just think it's really important that we preserve some pieces. So even now, if I have something a little bit special, I just think, well, I'll just keep that one somewhere in a box. You think one day you want to pass it down to the next generation and I'm sure they'll appreciate it, or hopefully they will. <laughs> I don't really worry too much about how frivolous I look with my clothes because I really don't spend that much money on them, to be honest. But I, I, I do obviously think, think a little bit about that. You know, when we started Help Refugees and we were obviously spending a lot of time going to Calais and going to refugee camps, of course I wasn't going to turn up in like... A fashionable outfit I was dressing down because you just want to be a bit considerate about the fact that you're surrounded by people who have nothing and I, I honestly I, I struggled to find coats because I was go it was freezing and I was trying to find a coat and all my coats are really bright and and I just thought you know this is really inappropriate I think I I did find a sort of old duffel coat in the end which which was okay but even <laughs> to be honest even that it's got like a hoodie on it with like sort of um faux fur like white fur it looks a bit like a father Christmas coat but actually what was amazing about that is a lot of the people the residents in the camp um you know who come from all these incredible countries you know afghanistan pakistan iraq um syria then they loved the coat and they all came up and they started chatting to me and they were like we love your coat and it was really funny and you just go they're just like anyone else do you know what i mean they 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 appreciate it and um and i remember there was um a moment one of the co-founders danny um spoke to a young boy who was there as an unaccompanied child i think he's 15 years old and she um asked him what, what he wanted you know can we get you anything and he was like i want a nike jumper you know because they're just teenagers the same as the teenagers are here um these rather strange pair of half leggings and half boots they have a kind of 60s vibe to them. I think they probably are original from the 60s. Kind of paisley, floro, floral design. And boots actually attach into leggings, which turn into a pair of trousers. So they transport you back to another time. And I think that's what fashion can do as well. I think it's a bit sad because I think when you watch a film from the 60s or the 70s, you know, everyone was wearing amazing fashion. You know, everyone just had fun. And... I just think we should all be maybe a little bit more adventurous um, and not be afraid of people looking or staring and just to have a bit more fun because otherwise what's going to happen in 20 years? Everyone's just going to be in kind of brown boiler suits or something the way it's going. Um, okay, so this is this is my little hat. I love a hat. I'm literally like obsessed with them. I rarely go out without my hat on. This is the one. This is like, when I found this one, I knew it. I was like, this hat is the one we're meant to be. We are soulmates. It's also just makes my head look a bit longer. So I like that. So when you're having a bit of a moon pig face day, like I seem to be having at the moment, you pop your hat on and you just feel like, oh, suddenly your whole face has been stretched. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I just, I'm obsessed with it. And if I lost it, I would be very, very sad. I do think life's a journey. And I think, you know, as you're getting older, which we all are, um, you have to become comfortable with where you're at at every point as well. I think we just need to relish each time for what it is and try and accept that because otherwise growing old is going to get tough <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it doesn't have to be. Um, I think life is an adventure as well. It's more than a journey, it's an adventure and we have to just try and make the most of it. Thank you to Liana Bird. I have to say, I feel bad, Dolly, but I'm cringing about the half leggings. They sound terrifying. I think probably on Liana, they would look fabulous. <laughs> but on me, they would look like waders gone wrong. I would wrong. say you looked more puzzled than, than disgusted. I loved what she said, though, about uh, having no rules. Yeah. Do you think that's the key to enjoying fashion and style? Yeah, I do. I remember I had a moment. I, the woman who I co-host my podcast with is the most fashionable Pandora size. Yeah, I mean the, the the fact I'm even using the word fashionable Viv shows how deeply unfashionable I am. Exactly. But she's like the coolest fashion girl in Christendom. Um and I remember going in once and I had like a like a Navajo kind of long cardigan. Um, and I had my hair in plaits and I was wearing some like turquoise jewellery. And she was like, you always go quite thematic, don't you? <laughs> so you really embrace the whole. She's like, you know, when you're wearing a white dress, you almost come as like a Bavarian milkmaid with all your accessories. And when she said that, I was like, oh, that's the difference between you and I. You don't go for obvious choices. You have fun. Whereas with me, I think I'm so much more cautious. And I do think I do have to play by a rule, a fashion rule. This is a look. And something she's really taught me is 
where style comes from are in those mad moments where you just break those rules and throw those things together that would make no sense on paper. I think that's how, I think you should be a Bavarian milkmaid every day. <laughs> I think that's fabulous. Thanks, I, I want to skip back. Uh, I was just, it's really playing in my mind. The piece of advice we heard before Liana from Lisa, who said, be kind to yourself always. I think it distills a lot of the advice we hear on this podcast, but also in magazines and books, it's really in the air now. But I do wonder why women fail to take this advice that keeps coming up what why do we find it so hard to be kind to ourselves do i don't know think? it's that old adage isn't it when you think about if you were to, to take the running commentary that's in your head and put it onto someone else it would be so unthinkably cruel um i actually had a really hippie-ish piece of advice that i will impart now because i think you'll enjoy it where every time you're being cruel to yourself or you're berating yourself or doubting yourself this woman told me that you should take a moment and say, darling, darling, Dolly, in your head to yourself, which sounds mad, but it's just to remind yourself that you're the one in responsible and loving hands. That's yourself. And you have to take that job seriously. So to almost think of yourself as an other for a moment and just be like, don't be don't be cruel to that person. I love that. I am so excited to be here on set with Gabby Logan. Uh, we're at the World's End, which turns out to be a pub. It's very <laughs> exciting. We've snatched a few moments with Gabby before she starts filming the Premier League show, her weekly football show for the BBC, and why shouldn't it be filmed in a pub? She's just finished a hectic summer schedule of athletics, including the World Athletics, where the legends that are Mo Farah and Usain Bolt both retired. Coming up, she has a whole lot of rugby with the Autumn Internationals and the Six Nations. And just by the way, she's also presenting the Women's Football World Cup qualifiers at the moment. It's the kind of timetable that is nothing to a woman who's established herself as one of our most trusted and versatile sports broadcasters. And she isn't limited to sport by any means. She does topical discussion programmes, game shows, not to mention a very convincing turn on Strictly, at which I think personally you were robbed. <laughs> Welcome to We Are Women, Gabby Logan. Hello, Viv. Lovely to Hi, see you. So and uh, see you. in this salubrious surroundings of this, uh, this pub in the world's end, yes, yeah, so this... we're not here every week. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, how often are you at an unusual location Well, like every this? week we are at an unusual location, but they vary and then we move the show around the country to try and reflect the fixtures that week, but also to, to get different guests. It's quite nice, actually. You get to see the insides of some really nice bars. They're always kind of sticky floored and being cleaned up from the night before. Yeah, we have got somebody cleaning the floor around <laughs> us. How is it for you having that very mixed up schedule, you know, doing sports? It means that you are a bit all over the place, doesn't it? It does, and I like that, I think. It's a bit of a juggle. Instead of two or three balls, it sometimes feels like there's five or six balls in the air. But I, it's for my personality, I think it works. I was thinking that this morning I left the house having breakfasted both children at seven o'clock and they're in their uniforms one was being dropped off by their dad the other was getting a lift to school and I thought when you're 19 it's getting yourself out the door is a huge deal isn't it and then you think about having kids and it would blow your mind I think if you thought that one day you were actually going to get out the door dressed with you know with children dressed as well I think every working mum should kind of give themselves a huge pat on the back every morning when they walk out the door and go yes everyone's alive and breakfasted that was that was a great great day <laughs> the theme for this podcast is the journey mm -hmm. and we're talking a lot about travel but we're also talking about the journeys that people take through their lives in terms of their career um, how have you overcome some of the challenges that you've faced what have been the strategies that you've used? I don't think you purposefully sit down and you know come up with a strategy. They evolve, don't they? And your personality evolves and your sense of grounding and who you are evolves and that is really important because that enables you then to see how important or not you are in, in the picture as well. You know, sometimes I think we can get into our own bubble and feel really um, upset about something that actually if we took a step back it's not that important and also you don't have you know nobody has to do anything you know so so it's saying actually no I don't really want to do that and I'm, I'm getting better at doing that. You're very wise Gabby I think <laughs> if you ever want to give this up you can become a life coach <laughs> you, you obviously think about things a lot yeah. Or maybe that's just through experience. I think this part of it is through experience. Um, recently, I did something quite uh, brave, which I also think is a, a maturity thing. I had a 10 year issue with someone, a professional situation, and I felt that perhaps he was holding something against me. He's very, very senior in the industry. And I knew, I, I think I knew in my heart what it was, and I knew that I had disappointed him. And so I took him out for lunch and I asked him, 
and I had and we said sorry and we, we moved on and it was amazing I think it's it's letting things go you know you're joking about Strictly at the beginning but but it, that caused me a few years of quite a lot of anxiety why didn't people like me enough to vote for me you know what what was wrong with me why did I I think I'm a nice person what did I do wrong I worked so hard you know I really wanted to nail those routines you know I haven't looked back at my face with the judges but I'm sure I must have looked just really disappointed I've disappointed you I don't because I think that was also an overriding factor in my personality in my youth and in my early 20s I just didn't want to disappoint anybody you know so I don't want to disappoint you you're Arlene Phillips I want you to love me you know and um now obviously I treasure the experience I have nothing but fond memories um I found myself in the back of a minibus one day with Stephanie Beecham and Alicia Dixon and we were on our way to a group rehearsal of course, Stephanie Beecham had had this massive career in film and television and met everybody, all the greats. And she told us this fantastic story about how she was about to sign a million dollar contract for a major cosmetics company when she was um, in her kind of 30s. And somebody produced some photographs that she had done with David Bailey, as she puts it, while a little bit squiffy um, on an island somewhere in the Caribbean. And they remove the contract because they said that and she remembers the shoot she just thought it'd be fun just to take her top off or whatever it was that she was doing but she was very sanguine about it and she said so remember girls you can do whatever you like in life but it will come back to bite you on the ass (laughs) and it wasn't she wasn't bitter and it was kind of a case of if you can justify it and you want to do it do it but be careful just think about things and the and the long game you know and the bigger picture and sometimes I think because of, of our very transient lives where everything comes and goes quickly, whether it's things like Snapchat and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. The the long game sometimes gets forgotten, doesn't it? Uh, One of the things I really want to ask you about uh, in sport, in football and and more generally thinking about the industry that you work in, do you think that traditional gender roles are changing? I do think traditional gender roles are changing and uh, there are more uh, women in more positions of authority and power, but there's still massive gaps. You know, you look at science and technology, And I did a documentary about women's football with Karen Brady. I interviewed her as part of it. And she says that she personally only invests in a company who have women on the board because having the voice of a woman on on, in that situation, it's going to be a more efficient, better board that will therefore lead to a better company. So it's not that she's doing it from a tokenistic point of view. It's about the actual bottom line profits of that business. Um, I have read that you are on a journey, the theme of this show, to love your nose. Learn uh, to love your nose. <laughs> what is that about? Oh, well, d- d- well, I think I know that? where you read that because I, it really drives me crazy and thankfully you haven't asked this question and I don't think a podcast of this calibre would. But there's so many interviews you do where you're asked, which part of your body do you not like? And I find that really it's such a damaging and potentially divisive thing isn't it to to get a woman to critique her physique I try to be more internal you know and go oh I'd like my lungs to have a bigger capacity so that I could run for long they left that answer out because they were so, so disgusted in me for not saying my bum or something so um, I told a story about um, when I was younger I really I honestly thought I would have a nose job by the time I was about 22 so Kenny when I met him I did actually hit it on a um, windsurfing accident and it did technically break but not really it's got a little hairline fracture and so when I met Kenny I said I've broken my nose and then years later he found out that I hadn't broke but he looked at a picture of me and he went so that's before your windsurfing accident I said yeah he goes you've got the same nose (laughs) so and um, I think I was fixated on the bump of my nose for too long so um, I once went to see a plastic surgeon I was like you know what forget it I haven't got time and I'm not that bothered by it and I'm so glad so glad I didn't touch it because I really now I don't um, I don't care for one. But my makeup artist, who's also quite um, what should we say, uh, blessed with a with a, a nice strong nose, uh, she says that it's the architecture of our face and it's going to hold our faces up into old age. I like the idea that it's scaffolding <laughs> that's kind of like <laughs> keeping my skin out. So um, yeah, I'm not I'm not bothered by it at all now. So the journey is complete. I love my nose. <laughs> that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Gabby Logan. Thank you so much. Really, really lovely to chat to you. Our thanks to Gabby Logan. Now, Gabby was talking there about this journey theme that we're talking about and the idea of looking at our experiences and endeavours as a journey. Do you think, Dolly, sometimes we get a bit preoccupied, though, with these milestones? And it's another way of being too focused on achievement, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah, I definitely, I can be guilty of that. And I think it's 
again, to go back to another hippie platitude for everyone, you know, the journey is the destination in many senses. And every day there are things to experience and learn. How do you think you've changed <laughs> from when you were younger? Um, oh, I was just so angry when I was a teenager. I just hated being young. I hated being dependent on people. So I think that that has engendered a real sense of calm as I've kind of managed to grow up and be the only one in charge of my life, <laughs> which makes me sound like a control freak, but it has just made me much calmer, I think. I'm interested, how do you think you've changed most from when you when you look back from when you were a teenager? Oh, how long have you got, Dolly? This is like 20 years of therapy you're asking me to recount now, and believe me, you don't only want to hear that if you're being paid to hear it. Um, I have struggled with self-criticism all of my life and it was very, very strong when I was a teenager. I mean, I look back now and I just think I don't know how I managed to do anything mm. because I always did everything with this voice in my head of you're not good enough, you're yeah, not good enough, yeah. this, is, you're, this, is, this is rubbish. And I had to almost develop a, an, another crazy side of myself who would be saying, no, it's totally fine. Everything's going to be fine. And that's how I got through it. And I do look back on my younger self and I feel really sorry for that person because I just think you're making up all of these threats that yeah. were completely fictional. And it's so sad as well. Sometimes I kept diaries when I was younger. Sometimes I look back at them and I see a list of everything I ate that day or the reasons why you messed up today or whatever. And you just, it's like thinking about your daughter you're like oh no don't do that don't say that to yourself I think what's interesting is that you look back on yourself and you think how could I have been such an idiot yeah and then you look at the things that you were doing that were idiotic and you realize that you actually still do a lot of them oh yeah totally. and I do think the human condition is generally being a fool and just as you get older, you realise how foolish you are, but you can't actually stop yourself. I completely agree with you that those habits will be ingrained for a lifetime, but it's about being able to catch them and be like, oh, I'm doing that foolish thing right now. And yeah. that's the kind of big difference. Well, I think I talk about this too much because my son, uh, who is seven, came home from school yesterday and he said... Mummy, I have done something today that was the action of a total fool. <laughs> and he basically went into the, <laughs> the swimming pool whilst wearing his pants underneath his swimming trunks, which is a really foolish thing to do. But I didn't expect a seven-year-old to speak about himself in that it's way. Such and self-awareness. It's completely my fault. <laughs> anyway... Now, we've come to the part of the show where we ask for some expert insight into our theme. And we're joined by someone who, in addition to her personal journey, works with women who have come a very long way, quite literally in that some of them are refugees, but also in terms of the experience they have had and the way they've fought to rebuild their lives. Britta Fernandez-Schmidt is Executive Director of Women for Women International UK, an organisation which works with women in countries affected by war and conflict, and which Mint Velvet is extremely proud to be working with. Welcome to We Are Women, Britta. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Now, we've been talking about the journeys um, that women make through their lives, and I wanted to talk about the journeys the women make, who you work with. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I um, I was I just travelled to uh, Rwanda in July, and I took my daughters, um, Emma and Sarah, and um, and I had the chance to meet my sister. Let me explain. Women for Women International, the way we support women is um, predominantly through sponsorship. So um, you can sign up to sponsor one woman and um, accompany her on her journey. Of course, normally you don't meet your sister. I had the chance to meet my sister. Her name is Brigitte and she is 20 years old. She has two children and um, so her family had never had money to send her to school. And when she was 15, they sent her to Kigali to become a maid and that's where she was taken advantage of and she um, became pregnant. She then had to leave her job because they shunned her. She went back to her family and her family didn't want to know anything about her because being a single mum is basically absolutely unacceptable. And that was really when Women for Women International found her and, and offered her the support to enroll in our program and meet other women and realize that it wasn't her fault. This is the thing that what women often do, right? We think it's, oh, we have done something wrong. 
But that is not the case. The fact is that society is still treating women in very, very, you know, different ways. And women are not given the same opportunities and they're not giving access to education and access to resources. And that's what Women for Women International is doing. Mm. So we really take women on this journey. The most important part of this journey is the reaching out a hand and saying, I believe in you. I know that you can improve your life. And that confidence is invaluable. You know, you can't measure it. But that is the journey that that I'm so passionate about. And that kind of gets me up every morning to yeah, do what I can. You're so passionate about it, Britta. It's, lo- it's lovely to hear you talk about it. What is the goal at the end of this year long journey that these women go on? I mean, we work in countries like um, Rwanda, as I said, in Congo. We are also in northern Iraq, where we work with Syrian women refugees and also the Yazidi, um, who you might have heard a large number of them were um, captured by ISIS and held as sex slaves. So our aim is to help them rebuild their confidence. But we also give them access to very practical skills and resources. Very importantly, we give them a cash stipend because we're talking about women who are living on 40 cents a day. You know, that is, I, I honestly don't know whether you can imagine. I mean, I don't know if I can really imagine what that means. 40 cents a day, what that's like 30p. That means in South Sudan that you can only feed your child once a day. And I always think, you know, you know, when you pick up your children from school, um, the first thing they say is, do you have a snack? They don't say, hi, mom. No, no. Do you have a snack? And and for me not to be able to say, yeah, of course, here, go, here you go, darling, is, you know, that is how real that poverty is. So we give them absolutely the confidence, but we give them access to knowledge and access to resources. And, and as a result of that, we see incredible changes. Women, after a year-long program, they triple their income. They're able to stand on their own feet. You know, they're sending their children to school. They rebuild their confidence. 13% of the women end up running for some kind of a leadership role. Can you imagine? I mean, wow. that is just insane. Yeah. You know, mm. change is absolutely These are possible. incredibly inspiring stories, but I do think a lot of listeners, and, and I'm feeling this way myself right now, will be listening to this and feeling guilty about their own good fortune in life or depressed by the enormity of all of this and the, the seeming endlessness of the suffering, that all the difficulties there are in tackling these problems. And I think sometimes we're tempted to just turn away because mm. it's so enormous. How do you personally engage with all of that and manage not to turn away from the enormity of all this? Yeah, that's. Yeah, I think that is such a great question, Viv, and that's a really important one to actually articulate. So number one, for me, guilt, like, let's just come on, let's pack it up, put it in a bin, and let's not do that anymore, right? Because why, why would we feel guilty? You didn't choose to be born to a middle class family. I didn't, you know, so you are here. So let's not talk about what we're going to do with this, right? Mm. What are we going to do with this amazing privilege? Don't ever think that you don't have the power because you do, right? Like you do. You can choose today to tell one other person about what's going on to host a coffee morning. I mean, do whatever it is that you love doing, right? So I am not going to give you the recipe for that because the key for me is that this is also your journey. Her journey is your journey and my journey is your journey. And I really, really believe that. And that's how I try and live my life. You know, guilt is not going to get you anywhere. So please don't feel guilty. Just think, you know, what do you want to do? And then do it. You do have this incredibly infectious uh, dynamism to you, Britta. But I know that there's a quote I once read from you. You said, during my career, I've heard this so many times. Oh, Britta is so passionate with the subtext. She doesn't have the gravitas. What's wrapped up in that for you? That's such an interesting thing. And I've heard it said about lots of women who are passionate. Yes, I know, right? Ah, it's only recently that I've completely owned my passion. I'm passionate. Okay, that's great, right? <laughs> and if you can't see that I also have a huge amount of gravitas. Yeah, and, and that you're serious. And yeah. I'm really serious yeah. about what I do. Absolutely, Dolly. You know, then that's really not my problem. I was coming up against barriers by just being passionate or being seen as that. So I've learned this thing that I call turning the volume up and down. You're on my level, right? I can be as passionate as I want and that's not going to overwhelm you. I'm so relieved, (laughs) Dolly, aren't you? We we love the passion. We can take it. Right, exactly. But there are some people who can't and that's okay. And so I'm never going to stop being me. I'm never going to stop being authentic, but I'm just going to perhaps talk a little bit slower, you know, and just really connect and, and find a different way of expressing 
what I'm trying to say. So very, anyway, very powerful. <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier as well your daughters who travelled with you to Rwanda. How old are they, and how do you keep them interested in these really important issues, but also protect them a little bit? Oh um, yeah. So Emma is just turned seventeen, and Sarah is going to be fifteen next week. So they actually grew up, I think, and, and as they were growing up, they became more and more interested in what I was doing. I've never imposed it on them, and there was this one moment. On the second day of our Rwanda trip, we had been driving for four hours to get to this place where I met my sister. There were about 300 women who had graduated from our program. And when we arrived, they started dancing and singing. And it was so overwhelming. And I saw my daughters, like tears, you know, running down their cheeks. And then they came to me they, on both sides and they held me and said, Mommy, we get it now. This is the best thing you could ever do. It's so inspiring to hear you. If people uh, are listening and feel that they want to help, what can they do? Um, I know it's for some of us, it's quite a big ask. Um, When you sponsor a woman, it's £22 a month um, for one year. If you can, that is really the most transformational act that you can do because you're not just giving the money. You are telling that woman that you are her sister and that you care for her. I just find it so powerful and I love the idea that you can be connected to a woman that you will never meet and that you're giving her that vote of confidence. Yes, that's exactly it. And if you don't want to give money and you want to get, you know, talk to your neighbourhood and tell everybody about Women for Women International and organise a party or whatever it is you want to do, everything counts. Literally everything counts. Oh my God, Britta, I want you to start a religion and I'm going to I follow you. you. Yay! Great. I'm right okay. the congregation. I'm, oh, seriously, it's like having the Dalai Lama here. <laughs> Uh, it's time now to reveal what will be the top of your list to achieve before your next birthday and I've got mine Uh, for me top of the list I want to spend more time with my children it's pathetic but I know that I'm not spending enough time with them at the moment and it's the most important thing what's yours mine's really bad in comparison to that I'd really like to get a good laundry system in place because I just feel like it's a very small thing, but I just feel like I've never mastered the art of laundry as an adult. I'm just thinking about how we can combine these two goals. So I could come around with my children (laughs) and we will all sort out your laundry. So your laundry will be done. I will have spent more time with my children. Job done. Do you know what I mean, though? I just feel like I haven't got into the the groove of it yet. I just feel like there's such extremity. There's either I have no pants or I just have wet clothes hanging everywhere. So I just... I'd like to, maybe let's call it self-care. Maybe that is what I'd like to master. Okay, good luck with that. You are definitely asking the wrong person about laundry. (laughs) That's it for now from us. Please tweet at Mint Velvet or come to the Mint Velvet Facebook page and tell us what you're determined to achieve before your next birthday. Do subscribe via Apple Podcasts, iTunes or SoundCloud. And do please rate us and review us because we're on an endless journey of self-improvement and general betterment, (laughs) as you know. My thanks to our guests today, Liana Bird, Gabby Logan, Britta Fernandez-Schmidt and Dolly Alderton. We Are Women is a Whistledown production for Mint Velvet. The producer is Kate Taylor. I'm Viv Groskop. Thanks for listening and goodbye. (laughs) 